one thing I'm always I always wonder about uh, games that are kind of released in in sort of the holiday season is the, the kind of pressure that the developers are under because uh, it's obviously it's the busiest time of year. Right. So how do you guys deal with that? Uh, are you you know are you concerned that you're you're gonna have a lot of competition? I mean, if you release the game in say I don't know March or something like that, <coughs> you'd have far less to worry about. Um, so how do you sort of focus on? Well, it depends. It depends on what you're talking about in terms of worry. And you know, yes, if you release during a quiet period in the market, you have less to worry about from a competitive standpoint. But you have a lot to worry about from a consumer standpoint. From a because we have the reason why games are released at holiday is because that's where the money is in terms of consumers. That's when they buy. Little Timmy gets a game bot for him, or you know, in this case, Big Timmy, because it's an rated game. But that notion of there's the Thanksgiving, Black Friday, there's the week before Christmas, there's all that kind of stuff, and so it's what it seems to be is that the sales cycle of holidays is, uh, kind of outweighs the competitive nature. At least if you're thinking you're going to be on the successful side of that competition. And right. so that's the thing for, for us this time around is just creating a game that we're really proud of that we feel can hold up against any sort of competition that we will face because I'm sure we'll face a lot of it. But um, we're kind of we're working really hard to know that we, that and and I think both from a quality perspective and both from, and from a value perspective. Like I said, when you look at the five big pieces of gears, that's a lot for a single game, and there's a lot of play in there, um, to, a lot of value in that in that game. And then, and then, I put on top of that our polish and quality expectations for our own titles, and then you're, you're going to get a good game from it. Right, right. Do you think do you find that fans of the genre will they uh, uh, of this, you know, sort of shooting action games? Do they buy them all, or do you find that they're sort of, uh, you know, they're they're kind of dedicated to this franchise or that franchise? It's a mix, really, the, the, because a lot of it is economically driven and rather than fan driven. I mean, there's people like myself who are in the industry, and, and, and I get a bit of a, a biased view because that's the people I, or my friends or are people in the industry, and we tend to buy everything that comes out almost new to, to be able to competitive analysis, but also just to play because that's more big gamers, and so and, and we have the income to do it. But the thing that's interesting is when I talk to other people, when I go and fan. Uh, you know, at Comic Con, and I meet fans and things like that. That people out there who buy two, three games a year, and so it's those type of people that you really have to reach out to, and that's the people that look at a game and say, does it have multiplayer? Does it have some life beyond the campaign that I can uh, get some sustained value out of it? So it's I think we see people in, in mix across the genres of first-person shooters and third-person shooters or whatever it is. Um, I don't think people are so hardcore that they're like. I only play Gears and I refuse to play all other forms of games. I think people are always open to finding a new gaming experience, but I think they're more driven economically of, okay, if I can only spend $60 this year, what am I going to spend it on? Right. All right, so that said, how, uh, what do you think differentiates uh, Gears of War from, from some of the other franchises out there? Well, I, I think the big thing for me is that Gears of War differentiates itself because of its personality. I think well, there's a bunch of different reasons, and when, but one of them that strikes immediately to me is that it's it's you got a character, it's got a personality. The characters have, like, we could sit here and talk about a whole bunch of games that are out that are very successful or, and were considered to be AAA games, but I couldn't name the hero character from that franchise. Um, and it, it's that sort of thing. Is that when you think about Marcus and Dom and, and Cole and Baird and the, the reactions that fans have to those characters, and when you put a character up in a gets written about in an article and all the comments that are cool are just one-liners from his dialogue or his combat chatter. It's just, I think people relate to it because it is a character-driven game. It's not just an action-driven game. And then I think, you know, when you add all the other stuff, the visceralness of the gameplay and how it feels like you know, rock fights when you're a kid and hiding behind and, and it's all really tense and and the the beauty of it and, and the, how grounded the whole thing is. and the visualness of being able to chainsaw monsters in half. You know, it's, there's a whole bunch of things that I think go into making a Gears fan a Gears fan. Right. Uh, since you mentioned the characters, um, is there any sort of female involvement this time around? <laughs> there is. <laughs> there is, there is, yeah. I mean, that was one of the big things for us when, when you go and do all these sort of fan events and you go to PAX or Comic-Con and those sorts of things and you do signing or you just meet and greet or whatever. And, there's a lot of female players who play Gears of War. That was the gear aspect for Gears of War 3. It, it really came through two different avenues, or it had two different meanings for us. One was when you go to like a PAX or a Comic Con, 
and you, you're signing posters and the lineup and you look at there's a lot of female gamers and for a game that is traditionally thought of as a thick neck testosterone um, male dominated game the fact that there are so many female players was surprising and so people like to project themselves into the game and want to have that representation and so we wanted to allow the female gamers to represent themselves in the game as well and so that they can run around as, as female characters and so that was a big a big deal for us and we wanted to provide that and then the other side of it is when you look at Anya in particular one of our, our main characters she went from being sort of the voice in your ear that dispatcher who's distant and remote in her dress in an office to now she's on the battlefield in armor with a chainsaw and she's killed some locusts and she's all dirty and gritty and, and the transformation of Anya through the three games is kind of the transformation of the world in the three games and it speaks to the, the desperation that even she has had to now give up that her previous role and now she's in the trenches fighting and that kind of stuff so it has a great like community and player based purpose but it also has a great fiction purpose as well. What about all the uh, tie-ins of the comics and the books and all that stuff? Uh, does that bear into uh, how you guys did design the game or is that are you just single-mindedly focused on the game and let all that other stuff take care of itself? Yeah, when we look at all the other mediums we definitely look at um, what what's there and what can we leverage but the game kind of is on its own and so there are times when if you're paying really, really, really close attention, you might notice that the game sometimes may disagree slightly with a comic or might disagree slightly with a, a novel, a part of the novel, just because the game is the game. And, and that's also the, the biggest readership, if you will, is in the game. And so we have to treat the game as the primary as a focus. And so we're OK with some slight discrepancies of if, we, if it means we can make the best game we can make. But that being said, you know, Karen was our book writer, now she's writing the game, and so that that t t tie over, and then we're actually bringing characters from the other mediums in, like Jace is our main co comic book character, and he's in Gears of War 3, Bernie is one of the main novel characters, and she's in, she makes an appearance and as a multiplayer character in Gears of War 3, so we're actually taking stuff that we, other fans were saying, oh, I love the comics, and I love Jace, or I love the books, and I love Bernie, and we're trying to reach out to them as well and say, well, you get to exp express that love through, you know, getting to see it. Here's what's uh, what about the movie? Last thing I read about it was that it was uh, back into development hell. Is that the case, or? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's been, and Cliff has answered, I think, that on a number of interviews about where it's, they kind of reimagining it a little bit in terms of what's the right way to present this kind of a, a subject matter, so, I don't really have a lot more to say on, on movie right. what about uh, what about movies that are based on video games in general uh, I think sort of the general consensus is I, unless you can think of a, of, a, of an example I uh, most of them are just not good they just don't turn out well right Why do you think that is actually I guess we we'll, we'll maybe start uh, there I don't know it, it's it's an interesting question about why I, but I, I think that was true I think if we had had this conversation a few years ago we'd be saying the same thing about comic books and how come comic book movies haven't taken off and I think part of it is taking it seriously I think why Spider-Man took off and, and Batman is having the budget to make it a, a real movie and, and, and part of it is making sure because the, the stories are there I mean the, the, the game stories but I think what happens is sometimes people get too caught up in being too true too literal to the game and they, and they earn the gears you know they earn the, the game fans but they don't get the general audience and so I think you have to be able to back that off. So I think you need the budget to support it, to say it's a real movie, and then I think you need to, to make sure you're appealing to a, ma a bigger audience than just the game fans, right? But um, the stories are there. I mean, when you try, when you talk through any of the games, um, they all would be great selling pitches for movies. So uh, I, I, don't know. I liked the first Tomb Raider, I have to say. You know, Anna G Angelina Jolie as Lara Croft and stuff, I thought it was really good, and I thought, but I agree with you, you know, as a, as a class, so it's like, it's like movie, movie-based games. <laughs> it's just like game-based, game-based movies and movie-based games don't tend to do very well. Yeah. And I think it's because you're being so restricted by being forced to, to follow the other mediums, whether it be the story or what's driving it. Because when you think about making a movie-based game, you're not coming out of it like, what's this really cool gameplay invention? What's this really new piece of innovation that we're going to do that's really fun to play? You're going, okay, well, I have to have this sports car in this setting. What are, what are my, you know, so the constraints are really, really high. And I think that's why. And they tend to be where you, 
you don't know all the details of the movie until probably less than 18 months to 12 months before you can actually really make things that are tied together and that's not enough time to make a great game. Yeah.